The following interview was conducted with Willis Shalio for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, July 11, 2008 at its residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and growing up in the early years. My home was Elkhart, Indiana. Uh, my father worked for the New York Central Railroad. <clears throat> my mother was able to stay home with my uh, older sister, older brother, and I. We had um, cherry trees in our backyard, so that was always a kind of a pleasant experience when the cherries would come on because uh, <clears throat> we got the privilege of picking the cherries and my parents then promptly canned them and they were available then during the winter months for cherry pies and all kinds of good things. Um, after high school and I had a... Tell us a little about grade school. It was grade school close grade by? School? Yeah. Grade school was just about uh, four blocks away from where we lived. <clears throat> and uh, had very good experience in grade school. The uh, teachers were very uh, positive about um, things that uh, you should be thinking about doing and and they encouraged us and it was a good experience all the way around. Mm -hmm. In the winter months uh, we would um, take our lunches because uh, they encouraged uh, everyone to just stay for the lunch period and then uh, carry your lunch uh, to school. After uh, graduating uh, from uh, high school, and I had a very good experience in high school, I had um, excellent teachers and a chemistry teacher in particular was uh, the one that encouraged me to uh, going to college. Before that I had no thoughts about college, but he felt that that would be the thing for me to do. Well, I didn't have any money, and my parents, none of them had ever been to college, so they were not excited about me going to college. But the chemistry teacher encouraged me, and he said, I tell you what, I think I can help you get a job. And sure enough, he got me a job at a brass company, and so for the next year, I worked for that brass company. I would uh, ride my bicycle. It was about um, a three-mile trip um, uh, one way. I'd carry my lunch. <clears throat> and of course, when you start out, you start out with the graveyard chip. And then you work your way. And... Um, Fortunately, I had a good friend of mine who uh, was working there, and uh, we developed a very good relationship uh, over the years. So I worked for that year, and uh, while I was uh, working, <clears throat> I got hold of the chemistry book that was used at Indiana University, and I, in my basement, where my parents were kind enough to allow me to set up a laboratory, I conducted all the experiments that were normally done in the freshman year of uh, college. So when I arrived at Purdue University, lo and behold, all of the experiments the first year of chemistry were old hat, and uh, I did very, very well in chemistry at, uh, at Purdue. Tell us <clears throat> how you decide to come, how did you uh, decide to come to Purdue? Did you come for a visit beforehand? Uh, it was through this uh, chemistry professor that felt that uh, Purdue would be the, the logical school for me to attend after finishing high school. Okay. So that's the way that when, developed. What year did you arrive on campus? Arrived on campus in uh, 1939. Okay. Tell us a little bit about what campus life was like. Um, <clears throat> student days. Yeah, what? Your student days. Student days. Well, when I arrived on campus, I uh, found a place to live, and um, it was in the upstairs of a home right across from where the Union is today. And um, turned out I had a roommate. Uh, I had never met this young man before. 
and lo and behold, he was uh, a musician. And so while I was trying to study, he was tapping his feet and preparing music for one of the shows that he, where he was going to play. Well, he lasted about he lasted about three months, <laughs> and there was too much music and not enough Stanford or not enough Purdue University, and so uh, he flunked out. Well, I had to find some way to earn some money. Kind of keep your voice this way so it goes in. And so um, <clears throat> I met this fellow uh, in one of my classes, and he said, "Hey, I understand." that the Kappa Kappa Gamma house is looking for somebody to wait tables. Wow, boy, I was down there in a flash, and fortunately, I was able to uh, find a job there. And, and for the next three years, and I, that was my uh, source of uh, food and income at the Kappa Kappa Gamma house. That worked out very, very well. You serve three meals a day? And it... Uh, <clears throat> Depended on, we alternated um, squeezing the orange juice for breakfast, and then we normally served the uh, lunch and and the dinner. Did this? Did they dress for dinner? Did they have to dress? For oh dinner? yes. What about lunch? Did yes. they dress for lunch? No, lunch they... lunch was kind of on the on the fly, because they were attending uh, courses. Uh, but in the evening, they all dressed, and it was, it was semi-formal. And they had the, the songs and, and the, the singing, and the, uh, the dinner was very, very well done. A good experience. What was your major at, at Purdue? <clears throat> My interest was in chemistry, and when I came here, uh, I had worked for the full year at this brass company, and so I became interested in metallurgy. So I took courses in metallurgical engineering from which I graduated. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, I had taken ROTC. So I graduated with uh, uh, the right to go to Officers Candidate School down at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Was ROTC required at that time? Did you have to? Uh... ROTC was required. Now there were there were a few exceptions. Like what? Person? If you had a physical problem of some kind, but uh, by far and large, the majority of them were in the ROTC program. Did that include going to summer camp? Did you go to camp in the summer? <clears throat> we normally would have gone to summer camp, but of course, in the meantime, the war, the war had started. And so instead of going to summer camp, uh, when we graduated from Purdue, they sent us to Officers Candidate School, which was an accelerated program generating uh, second lieutenants. And at the same time that, that I graduated from uh, the program <coughs> at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, they were looking for liaison pilots. And the liaison pilots were the substitute for the forward observers. Instead of trying to climb a tree to observe artillery fire, they now wanted you up in an airplane where you could look down on the artillery fire. And um, physically I qualified for that program and then um, I learned to fly Piper Cubs and Arancas and all of the other liaison airplanes at the uh, Army artillery had. So that was a good experience. Three and a half years in the um, military. We were sent to Germany right at the conclusion of the war in Europe. 1945. And so <clears throat> it was after the Battle of the Bulge when they called for extra troops. In the meantime, we had been training in uh, California for the invasion of Japan, but they suddenly jerked us sent us over to uh, to Germany. But we didn't uh, linger very long in Europe because they had other plans for us and they sent us back to the States for a very short leave and then out to the west coast and off we went to uh, Japan by way of uh, the Philippines. Did you go by boat? 
Oh, yes. Yes, because this, you know, we sent, not only did we take all of our troops, but we took a large number of our supplies and, and equipment with us. On the boat. Or on the ship, that's correct. And we stopped at the Philippines on the way over, and then we ended up in uh, Yokohama. And uh, from there we moved up the coast to one of the spots that they had reserved for the, uh, <coughs> the military units. I gather the war was over by that time. You went there after the war? After oh, yes. Japan had surrendered? Yes, Japan had surrendered. And so um, we were part of the occupation. So for the next nine months, it was the Army of Occupation. We ended up uh, in a, a silk mill in a little town called Weda, U-E-D-A, which was up in the mountains. And um, our major thrust there was to remove whatever weaponry was found in the vicinity, and it was largely just a matter of small arms and, and this sort of thing up in the mountains where we were. But our uh, battalion commander would periodically line us up and send us through this warehouse and we were allowed to take one item each time as we walked through the warehouse. So we ended up with a number of samurai swords and, and bolts of silk from the silk mill, all of which <clears throat> turned out to be good trading material. And so that was kind of my experience in the um, military. And after returning then from Japan, I became interested in further education. So I applied to Stanford University and was accepted. Okay. Were you married at that time, at this time? I had married um, the day of graduation from Purdue. And um, my wife uh, had a job uh, in uh, Missouri, and so I was able to find my way back and forth there occasionally uh, during uh, my training period. And then uh, <clears throat> she went with me then when we were, were assigned in California. And that's where she stayed and where our first child was born. So while you went to Europe and then Japan, she stayed in California? She stayed in California. And she worked in various places around in this uh, the little town where we uh, were staying. <clears throat> so after the war is over, and oh, incidentally, my roommate in Japan just happened to be a Stanford graduate. And so he convinced me that Stanford was a place that I Palo should. Alto was for you, right? <laughs> Stanford was a place for me. And so after the war, uh, my wife and I moved there, and she got a part-time job um, in a um, women's residence hall, helping there. And while she was doing that, <clears throat> I attended Stanford and, and got my PhD there. In metallurgy? In metallurgical engineering. Mm -hmm. While I was a, a student <clears throat> at Stanford, and, and of course the courses were not available in the summertime, so I got a job in a silk, or I'm sorry, not a silk mill, but in a steel mill across the bay. And I would ride my bicycle across the bay and work in the steel mill. Well, of course, if you're the, the latest employee, you get the, the job that nobody else wanted, which was the graveyard shift. Well, one night during a graveyard shift, the crane operator apparently got the wrong signal and he dropped something on my foot. Fortunately, I had on uh, steel-toed shoes, but it still damaged my foot and so that cured my interest in working in the steel mill. And I got a job with uh, Westinghouse uh, Electric, had a plant uh, near Stanford University and they needed someone to help with x-rays. They were x-raying the castings to determine if there were any cavities or, or crevices, defects. any defects. So I worked there then for <clears throat> about two years while I was finishing my PhD at uh, Stanford University. 
Upon graduation from Stanford, uh, I was offered a job at the Hanford Works of General Electric Company. It was a classified program, of course, and so we were not told what we were doing, what we were making. We were told how we were going to get it done, but it was all compartmentalized, and so they told you just as much as you needed to know. And then one day, they gathered us together in this large lecture room, and they said, now today we can finally tell you there is today one fewer island than there was yesterday. And that is because they've used this new bomb, using this material that we've been generating here at the Hanford Work. Kind of interesting. I, I was given specific assignments there that had to do with the metallurgical aspects of the operation. Fascinating, fascinating project. Did, did your wife go with you or did she stay in California? She moved with me, but by that time we had two children. And so uh, we had a very nice home and her mother came with us and uh, helped also uh, with the children. And so it was an interesting experience because everyone there was a stranger until they'd been for there for a while and then everybody took their arms around each other and it, it was a kind of a pleasant experience, but it was quite different. How, lo how long were you there? I was there uh, about uh, uh, two years. And then one day, <clears throat> I got a telephone call from an old friend of mine in high school. And this, this young fellow and I had had interests in high school together, and we'd been buddies. And it turned out that he was now the manager of a company in Elkhart, and he needed somebody to head up an engineering department. Well. I knew nothing about what this was all about, but he felt that he had the job for me and he wanted me to come and he made me an offer I couldn't refuse. So we closed down our um, home and the uh, operation in Richland, Washington, and we moved back to uh, Northern Indiana. And for the next three years, I worked for the Northern Indiana Brass Company. And Nibco's function was to make plumbing fittings. And they would take pieces, straight pieces of tubing and bend them into elbows or make uh, tees for uh, various plumbing situations. And um, so I was there for uh, a couple of years. And <clears throat> in the meantime, then I was offered a, a job at Bendix Corporation which was more technically oriented, and so I decided to go there, and it was with Bendix then for about the next uh, two years. That's in South Bend? It was Bendix and South Bend. And they were, they were working on various technical problems associated with uh, the rocketry and, and this sort of uh, thing. And <clears throat> Right about that time, uh, Bendix decided that uh, they were not going to major in this kind of activity anymore, so they started to phase out this operation. And I heard about a job at a company called Chicago Telephone Supply in Elkhart. It was CTS was uh, the abbreviation for the uh, letters. And they had operations in both Elkhart and West Lafayette. Um, I had created some interest with some ideas that I had for some new products while I was in, with them in Elkhart for a year, and then they uh, wanted me to come to West Lafayette, where they were opening up a brand new plant. And so I came here. Where was it located? And it was located, uh, and the, the building is still there today, out in the industrial park. It's, um, uh, Here on Yeager, Yeager Road? At, at the, that's Yeager right. Yeager and, and Cumberland. That's correct, at the intersection of those two roads. 
So then I was uh, <clears throat> uh, with them until they decided that they were no longer going to be in this uh, kind of business. It was, um, it was associated with products that had to do with uh, very, very latest development. And so the requirements were very strict and apparently the CTS decided that the, the income from that kind of program was not what they had in mind because of the risks involved. Very specific. That's right. And so um, the um, Chicago Telephone Supply, the CTS operation in West Lafayette, they decided to close it down. Were now, they here for very long? Was the com was it here I think they were here about five or six years. And when I came, one of the, when I came from the Elkhart uh, main plant of CTS to the West Lafayette uh, operation, one of the things they wanted to do is they wanted to develop a relationship between the CTS subsidiary here in West Lafayette and the faculty at Purdue to see if they could generate some sort of interaction and working together that would benefit both parties. And so that was one of my functions while I was here for the three years, excuse me, was to develop this relationship with the faculty at Purdue and a number of those came from chemistry. When they finally decided they were going to close then the West Lafayette operation, um, I contacted some of the people that I had met in chemistry at Purdue, at Purdue and they said, uh, <clears throat> hey, we think there's a job going to open at Purdue. And so lo and behold, um, I found myself working in the Department of Chemistry and I was there um, about three years. Okay, what year was this now? And uh, see, now we're talking about in the 50s. What, uh, was your, what was the nature of the work? What were you doing in the chemistry department? Well, the, the nature of the work was something that was, that was quite different than anything I'd ever done before. There, instead of my actually having my, my hands on some of the work going on, my responsibility was to stimulate the people who were already there and had been in their jobs for many, many years to continue doing the kind of things that the Sorry, Department of Chemistry wanted. Training and get them in. So it was a matter of training and, and filling spots when they would somebody would leave or would move and make sure that the right person got in the right spot. Mm -hmm. okay. And that was not my cup of tea because I had always been part of the action myself and now all of a sudden I was not creating anything I was I would had to have somebody else do the creating do the hands-on right and so I found uh, I received an offer from Purdue um, in a different um, activity and that's associated with the uh, School of Electrical Engineering and uh, the head of the School of Electrical Engineering came to me and, and he said, I think I've got a job that, I, that you would like to do. In the meantime, now when I left chemistry, I worked for a short time with the co-op program. The university co-op. University co-op program. But the School of Engineering, just their co-op The program. Schools of Engineering. And again, you know, my experience in industry was helpful because I had a pretty good idea of what some of the things sure. that were going on in these yeah. various industries. Especially in placement and talking to people about what the job might in turn. Now, part of what that job entailed was to actually visit the students who were working and to see hands-on what they were doing and to encourage them uh, along the way. Okay. Let me ask you this, but you coordinated the program, but in each of the schools, was there someone also there was on site, to, or local? Okay. Each of the schools had their own coordinator, and my job was to make sure that all of this program work to the advantage of both the company and the students. Sure. And it was a good experience. Mm -hmm. It was a good experience. 
Had and the program been in operation for some time, this co-op? Oh, the co-op had been in, in operation for many, many years. Okay, okay. It, um, it was taking a, a slightly different shape uh, because of the, uh, the work situation at the moment, but uh, it was still, the basic idea was you learn right there on the job with the work that, that there, that company is doing at that time. Right. It was a combination of going to school and then be working on the co-op program, going on co-op. It worked to the advantage of both the company and the student. In the meantime, the uh, head of electrical engineering um, came and, and talked to me about wouldn't I like to come and help him with an uh, industry university relation kind of program. And um, I felt it had uh, merit and he made, uh, made me a very good offer. And so I uh, spent the next three years then in the School of Electri Electrical Engineering and helped them develop the, the uh, program that they had <coughs> with uh, industry. And uh, industries then were more than willing to come to the university and to donate a chunk of money that the university could use in any fashion that they would choose. And it gave them access then to the students that were graduating. And each year then we would have an annual program where the students would present to the people in industry a summary of the research that they had been doing. Sponsored by the, by the company? And in some cases it was sponsored by the company, but in many cases it was just an opportunity for the industry to get some idea of the quality of the student and the kind of work that they had done. And if they found that there was mutual interest, then they were, would have their mutual discussion and that would later lead to employment. So that was a very positive program, and it generated a substantial amount of money for the okay. School of Electrical Engineering. Okay. Okay. Was there any tie-in with the co-op program? Because the co-op worked with industries too, or was this a little bit separate? I mean, would some of the industries probably take some of the co-op uh, students? Oh yes, it turned out so that there were some of the some of the industries in which this was a, a dual function, okay. but um, the um, the monetary uh, benefit for the School of Ex uh, Electrical Engineering was very, very positive. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> and so that was the uh, program that I was in. Uh, there was one final program that I did have some uh, relationship with, and that is the School of, uh, of um, Materials Engineering wanted someone to help with uh, one of the courses in, uh, teach one of the courses. And so my last two years with the university, I was doing a co the co-op program uh, and the relationship to industry. And then I was also teaching with the uh, School of Material Engineering. Okay. What, were you, what was the class, uh, what course were you teaching? And it was, it was a course, uh, and I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to remember the name of the, of the course at the moment, but it was it was materials engineering, sure. okay. and we covered uh, metals and ceramics and polymers, plastics. Okay. Notice that metallurgy now it's materials engineering, is it not? Has changed. Yes. And yes. The field, of course, has changed, but so is the, the terminology. The terminology has changed. Uh, I, I remember when I took my courses uh, originally, we were taking such courses as. Uh, it had to do with the recovery of gold because, of course, um, one of the professors had had a relationship with the gold mining industries, and so he wanted to bring in his particular expertise, and uh, it was fascinating. I bet. <laughs> it was fascinating. Yeah, right. The stories that he told about the the uh, rough and ready times of the gold fields. <laughs> uh, um, how has the campus changed, the land, the ch campus changed since you've been here? And uh, well, housing, when you first came here, what was housing like? Was there a lot of houses or apartments? 
when you first came? There in? were a large number of homes. Uh, when you came on the staff and came here? There were a large number of, of these that were available, and uh, <clears throat> as I say, you know, we, uh, they were, it was a three bedroom home that I remember, the first place where I lived. And of course, <clears throat> the students all had uh, their um, desks right alongside of their beds. And so. Um, this is when you were a student. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was pretty, pretty close fit. Now, of course, there were, there were no cooking facilities in these situations, and uh, but there were many, many restaurants. I remember where the bookstore currently is, right at the center of campus, used to be a very, very large restaurant. The University Bookstore? Yes. Yeah. That's interesting, yeah. Well, when you came to CTS and then came on to Purdue, what was the housing like and where else did you live? When you and your wife after you came to Purdue. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm gonna have to get a drink. Okay. Um, Are we talking about the the housing when you came? You worked with CTS, and then but then you came on the faculty and staff at Purdue. What was the housing like, and where did you live when you were working here on one staff? <clears throat> uh, when it came to CTS, there were numerous uh, homes available, and um, I, by that time, of course, I had a family of uh, three children, and um, so we found a house and um, bought that, and we lived on Pathway Lane then for the next uh, about 15 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the other things that I wanted to ask, were, uh, were you ever a faculty fellow at all in any of the <coughs> dorms? I'm trying to remember the um, the faculty person's uh, name at the moment, but uh, through our church, this uh, professor uh, called to my attention the fact that he'd been a faculty fellow and was having an enjoyable experience, and so he uh, developed an interest, and I became a, f a faculty fellow, and uh, attended. Um, and I'm try trying to remember now the <laughs> the exact time frame, but anyway, over a period of about uh, two years, um, <clears throat> I would uh, eat with the students and and share activities, and and that was a good experience. What do you remember? Which one building? What dorm were you in? I was in the one uh, where the uh, small children were. Oh, uh, Fowler. At at Fowler. Okay, all right, yeah, that's nice. And they had a lot of activities, the Winter Whispers and dances. Oh my, and that that was a that was a a very positive uh, program in yeah. my experience. Yes, right. Yeah, and incidentally, yeah. <laughs> and amongst other things, uh, one of the ladies who was on the staff. At this residence hall, turns out is now living here, also. Very interesting. <laughs> so, Will well, McKay. Yeah. How has the campus changed over time since you've been here? The campus, campus. Oh here. my! Of course, it's expanded, expanded so much, and the uh, all of the brand new buildings and so forth and so on. <clears throat> uh, I think the I think the campus is um, of an even more serious uh, note now than as I remember it as a student. Now maybe it's because I'm no longer <coughs> associated with the, the young people that you don't get the feel for that, and that's probably probably the case. But it's interesting to see now that we have a. Uh, a lady president, and um, that's as it should be. Um, I was, I had the pleasure of working under a number of uh, staff members uh, that have uh, left an impression on me, and the, um, the program has been positive. That's 
Schmidt. Yeah, Schmidt. No. Um, let's see. Chauncey Village. How has that changed since you've been here? Huh. <laughs> well, it has... Um, it's become um, more glitzy, but then that's, that's part of uh, what's going on uh, in our world. Um, but I remember the, uh, the various stores. Uh, when I first came here, <coughs> where a student could go in and um, for, um, I think it was something like a dollar and a half, you could have a meal. And of course, that was uh, where, where some of the bookstores are today. There were restaurants there when, when I was a student back here in the 40s. Yeah, interesting. The, um, then there were, the, of course, the fraternities and sororities, but the residence halls, did they, they served meals though, didn't they? Because you were a fat fellow. Oh, yes. yes. But in the earlier oh, yes. years, when you were a student, it was a lot different. Well, of course, <clears throat> I was, uh, I worked at the Cap Cap Yama house, and so I didn't really um, have too many um, activities associated with the residence halls. Sure, right. Were a lot of the uh, social events in the Union, or the dances, that's where they were held in the Union? Ah, uh, yes. Though, now, those were big events. Those were very, very well orchestrated, uh, very well monitored, um, and lots of fun. Lots of fun. I remember must, lots of them. If you were an ROTC, was there an ROTC um, ball or military Oh, ball? yes. Yes. But of course, you have to remember that uh, the war began while, uh, while I was in the ROTC, and so some of those activities were were no longer uh, as glitzy as they had been earlier. When the war came and you were still a student, did that have, how did that affect the classes or anything? Did they speed it up or what? Uh, well, uh, yes, we were going year round. S summers as well. Uh, summers as well, okay. and <clears throat> that was that was part of the complication because some of the courses, uh, one of them that I remember in uh, metallurgical engineering. Uh, where we were doing the uh, assaying, fire assaying, uh, to determine the gold content of, of the ores. Of course, that was not, they were not excited about operating those hot furnaces in the middle of the summer. And so they had to do some changing in, in the uh, course assignments and so forth uh, to make everything fit. You also um, have done some, written some books on the history of your, your family ancestry. You make a couple comments on that. And the book on, that's in the library, in the French Huguenots, the history of and the, your family ancestry. Uh, as a boy, I was always curious about my family name. And so I probed my parents, <clears throat> and they then referred me to some of my relatives in uh, Mishawaka. And uh, neither of my parents spoke German. Or if they did, they never spoke it publicly. But uh, when we had our family reunions, which was an annual event, there was always a gathering that would take place that the adults would stay in the home where the uh, reunion was being held, they would be in the, in the uh, parlor and oftentimes they would speak German. Well, of course, all the young people were outside and we were playing baseball or something out there. And, <clears throat> but I remember the German being spoken. So uh, when I was in junior high school, uh, they started uh, promoting the uh, study of Latin. And um, one of the teachers encouraged me to, to go that direction, and I've been uh, indebted to that person ever since because it gave me a, a great love for the English language and its the sources. And, of course, then with my relationship with uh, my family in Germany and all, 
I then found myself uh, be, becoming interested in other languages. So eventually I ended up uh, learning German and French and uh, some Japanese and, uh, and then Spanish also. And <clears throat> this, uh, I developed a real love for, for the language. And it made it very easy for me then in later years when I decided to delve into our family history because uh, I was up to my elbows <laughs> in French and German uh, and in dealing with my relatives in Europe. And, and they, they related that interest and in turn were willing to open their lives to me and it provided tremendous dividend over the years. I've, um, at the time I didn't realize what was going on, but um, it was a sense of uh, togetherness that uh, was created by the different languages. And, uh, and being a, a student and of interest in the family history, I then went on later and wrote a number of books mm -hmm. about our family. Did you, and you, have you visited some of the, in France or Germany? Oh my yes, visit all of them. Anyone who would, <laughs> say that who would ever, who would ever say that they were related to me. <laughs> and I never will forget meeting this gentleman in uh, France. And when I saw him, he had some of the same features of my father. That was um, an eye-opener, sobering, sobering experience. I would imagine that's right. <laughs> <clears throat> and but I must say that that once I was able to tackle their language, that these people opened their arms, and it they was, felt comfortable talking in yes, their native. Yes, and it it was a very, very warm experience. Yeah, that's right. Let's tell us um, retirement activities. What have you been doing since you retired from Purdue? Can you share anything with us? Well, since I retired uh, from Purdue, I've, I've been tackling more and more of my uh, genealogy and um, I've ended up uh, writing something like three books on the subject and uh, visiting Europe and having a tremendous relationship. It's been very, very gratifying. The, the investment was well worth the time. Good. Yeah. And keep in touch. Yeah, yes. That's very good. Okay. Yeah, we're, we are in touch now with, uh, on the internet. Which is nice, a little easier. <laughs> <laughs> and quicker, right? And cost saving. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, do you have a fun, uh, if I ask you, uh, if you have a fond memory of Purdue, something that comes to your mind? Fondest memory of Purdue? Wow. The, tradition. the fondest memory. Yeah, or a fond memory. Well, of course, you know, I, having raised my family here, I've uh, had a very close relationship with each of them. <clears throat> fond memories. I think one of the uh, fond memories I have was attending the uh, various shows with my family at the Union, or, I'm sorry, at the uh, Music Hall. And uh, when, when my wife and I were, were active here, we regularly attended all of the uh, musical productions. There were quite a few. And over the years, there were many. Exactly, exactly. Never had a bad one. Yeah. <laughs> Even Bob Hope was here one time. They used to have the Victory Varieties. Victory Variety. Uh, oh yes, great shows on Friday and Saturday night at home football games. I, I went to a few of those, and my brother-in-law and sister were here a couple of times, so it was nice. Um, and you mentioned football. We just happened to be have an interest in that also. Very good. That's and my a, wife and I attended many of the games. It's colorful. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask you one final thing. Do you have an outstanding event in your life that uh, you care to share with us?
Well, the outstanding event in my life was when, during the war, when I was observing artillery fire. From the plane? I'm, I'm in my airplane observing artillery fire with uh, an observer. When all of a sudden I see a little puff of white smoke off in the distance. And that tells me immediately that someone is trying to shoot me down. Now the problem is that once you're in the air and you take on the, the observation of the artillery fire, you have a responsibility to stay in the air. And that was a very, very difficult time to decide to stay in the air so that the observer could observe artillery fire. And so it was a matter of second guessing which way the next burst was going to occur in the air. And so it was a kind of a guessing game between the Germans who were trying to shoot us down and me up there trying to keep that airplane there while we could observe artillery fire. That was um, very difficult, very difficult. I would imagine, yeah, I would imagine. Um, any questions that you'd like to ask that were not asked and any closing comments? Uh, I guess there's one closing comment that I didn't mention anything about the trip over uh, by ship. <clears throat> As we entered the um, English Channel, they started to drop the death charges. And of course, this was a brand new experience. And we, of course, were immediately advised as to what was going on. But that was, uh, that was a period when you wondered if you were going to survive. Yeah, yeah, okay. Any other uh, summary or closing comments you'd like to share with us for the researchers that you care to make? Uh, I would only like to say that, you know, that my experience with Purdue have been positive. And it's been a, it was a great learning experience as a student, and it was a great teaching experience as a teacher. Very good. Thank you, Professor Shelley. I appreciate that. This closes the interview. Thank you.